Um, so we're going to continue our celebration of Advent this morning. And last week we looked at the topic of love, and, and uh, I for one love that we didn't actually burn down the building. Uh, uh, that was pretty good, you know. Uh, <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, as we ant- anticipate the day where we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ here in a few weeks, is what we're really celebrating is, is authentic biblical agape love, the love of God entering into the world through his son, Jesus Christ. And we're celebrating the very love that God has for us, so much so that he sent his son to be the perfect sacrifice. And last week we saw that agape, self-sacrificial, unconditional love can only come from God because we saw that God is love. And when we understand this love for God and love for people, um, that will become our way of life. Love will become our way of life. Speaking of loving God, uh, so a couple of people have asked, and just as a side note, we will be having church on Christmas Day. Um, I understand people have plans and, and all that, but um, just as your pastor, I, I can't with good conscience not have church on Christmas Day just because it lands on Sunday. In fact, if, Chris, if Christmas is really all about Jesus, then shouldn't we want Christmas to be on December 25th uh, on a Sunday so we can gather together? I'm not talking about any other pastors, any other churches. I had a healthy debate with a friend of mine this week who's doing something different, and I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> if that, your conscience does allow you for that, but we're going we're gonna to join. We're going to gather and, and worship Jesus. Amen? All right. So uh, please turn your Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. We're going to look at the topic of joy this morning as we've already sung uh, words of joy. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. And when you find it, if you can, please stand for the reading of the word, Luke 28 through Luke 2, 8 through 20. Word of God says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they had saw it, they made known that saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they heard and seen as it has been told them. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you. We thank you for this beautiful morning. We thank you for who you are. We thank you uh, for the gift of your son. We thank you for this season. We thank you that because of you, we can have joy, an unspeakable joy. Father, let me decrease and you increase. Speak to someone's heart this morning that someone may be encouraged, that someone might Walk out of here a little more joyful and have your way in this house. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. So one old Christmas poem says, "'Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. For me, it was Christmas, the Christmas of 1993. I had just turned 10 years old when it happened. Being a Chicago's Bulls fan, as I've told you before, I I dreamt for, I hoped for, I begged for, and I probably even prayed for a pair of Michael Jordan shoes for Christmas, even though I knew with the enormous price tag of those shoes, I 
probably wasn't going to be able to get my wish. And so it was the night before Christmas when I spotted a box under the tree with my name on it. The box was in a shape of a shoebox, and my heart suddenly jumped for joy in anticipation that a Christmas miracle might just take place. And so I did what every uh, young kid would do. I wisely waited until my parents went to sleep. And I did what disobedient yet excited children often do as I snuck into the living room with a small flashlight. And I very quietly and gently peeled back a portion of that wrapping paper to catch a glimpse of this box. And, and uh, now that wasn't very difficult because this particular present uh, was obviously wrapped by my father. And he was not a good uh, uh, very good at wrapping presents. In fact, is there any men in here that are good at wrapping presents? No, I don't think so. It's usually not our gift. Uh, 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 but uh, anyways, as I peeled back the wrapping paper late on Christmas Eve, my heart again jumped for joy as I saw the jump man symbol that indicated that in this box was, in fact, uh, uh, shoes, Michael Jordan, Air Jordan shoes. I quickly went back to my room as to not get caught, and I stayed up all night with joyful anticipation of opening the gift, pondering what color Jordans they might be, and Christmas morning eventually arrived. And when it came time to open presents, I ripped open the package, and I was so excited because the box was, in fact, an Air Jordan shoe box. And so I went to open the box with a vision of impressing my friends by walking around the neighborhood with these Air Jordans on. However, when I opened the box, uh, the actual box, actual Jordan, Air Jordan box, to my great dismay, the box was filled with underwear and socks. The box was wrapped in a box indicating the shoes would be inside the box, but it was just the box. It was just the box. I don't know where my dad found this box. He was working for a trucking company, so maybe he just found it. He wasn't trying to be mean or cruel to me. He thought He probably thought it was cool, but it was just the box. My immense joy changed to immense disappointment, and I tried to hide it, but it was obvious to my father that uh, what had happened, he felt bad, so I felt bad. But brothers and sisters, it was just the box. Now, ironically, God is so good, and he just gives gifts to his children. I'm going to keep an eye on that. Um, (laughs) uh, That a few days later, Uh, We were in the mall, and we just so happened to find some Air Jordans on clearance. God is good. I don't know why. We don't deserve it. So it was a happy ending. But when I opened the, the present, it was just the box. And all potential joy was shattered in that moment because it was just the box. And so as we consider the topic of joy this morning, I must first remind you, as I did with the topic of love, that any true sustaining joy will only come from Jesus Christ, our Savior, for he is our joy. Yet the truth of the matter is, even as Christians, we tend to find joy in all the wrong places. And to use the illustration, we at times go around opening boxes that are really just false advertising. It's really just the box. We look to people to fill our lives with joy. We look to material items to fill our lives with joy. We count on promotions and financial success to fill our lives with joy. We believe a change in circumstances will give us joy, and sometimes we even look to the world to give us this joy, but all those are simply empty boxes and nice wrapping paper for if you first don't have a relationship with the only one who can truly give you joy, there can be no real joy. You'll just go around opening boxes. And so point one, number one this morning is that God, God is the only one who can fill us with joy. God fills us with joy. I'll be jumping around in the scriptures a little bit this morning, so feel free to take notes. I have scripture references uh, on the slides, but Romans 5, 8 through 13 says it like this. He says, for I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's faithfulness in order to confirm 
the promises given to the patriarchs. And in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, and as it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let the people extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even uh, he who arises to rule the Gentiles in him with the Gentiles will put their hope in. May the God of hope, he says, may the God of hope, this is Paul's prayer. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and in believing so that the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. He says, may, may, may the God of hope fill you with joy. Family, it is only God that gives us our joy. You see, brothers and sisters, at this point in biblical history of the birth of Christ, Jesus was born roughly 700 years from the time the prophet Micah, in Micah chapter 5 verse 2 said, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little among the clans of Judah, for you shall come forth from me, one who is to be the ruler of Israel, who is coming forth from old, from ancient of days. This was a prophecy, yet the box had not been opened yet it has been 700 years from the time of that prophecy to the time of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. And then there was roughly 400 years of God being silent between the time God spoke to the last Old Testament prophet Malachi until Jesus was born on Christmas morning. And through all these agonizing years, Israel still remained in a constant state of anticipation that the Messiah, Israel's ruler and and king, would arrive and save them and restore their fortunes fortunes of Israel, reestablishing the throne of David, when suddenly, suddenly, the glorious day arrived, an angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds, watch, who were watching over their flock in a field, and the glory of the Lord shone all around him, and they were told that indeed in the city of David, finally, 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 a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, had been born. Family, the Bible says that this was good news and of great joy. This was good news of great joy that the Messiah was born for this gift of Jesus Christ was and is not just an empty box with nice wrapping paper on it. The gift of Jesus Christ given to us from God the Father was and is still the greatest gift ever given to mankind. And the gift of Jesus putting on flesh 2,000 years ago is the only way God can fill us with joy. For without Jesus, there's no forgiveness of our sins. There's no way to have a relationship with our Creator. The shepherds did not completely understand that the Messiah was born as a baby in a manger, was also God in the flesh. But the Bible says that Mary treasured all these things in her heart, pondering them in the heart. And as the shepherds returned to the pastures, they too, along with the angels, began glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen and had been told them. You see, God the Father had finally opened the door. God the Father had finally opened the door for the possibility that through faith in Jesus, we too could be filled with joy. I don't know about you, but it seems to me that it's even more apparent that this world will not give you joy. This world will not give you the joy you're looking for. It's even more important, uh, more apparent that the fleeting joy of temporary earthly victories always somewhat seem to come up short. That the fleeting joy of, of comfortable living can end in a moment's notice. That the fleeting joy of anything other than being filled with the joy that God provides can evaporate so very quickly. But family, Paul's prayer for us in Romans 15 is that God would fill us with joy. Because God filling us with joy is the only way we can have true joy in this world. And you see, the difference between joy and temporary happiness is that happiness depends on external circumstances, all going your own way, but overflowing joy, in, uh, joy that comes from the inside depends on your relationship with God. Even the world can have uh, happiness and momentary happiness, but it takes, the, uh, it takes God to give us joy. You see, it's easy to be happy, isn't it, when everything's going your own way. But just like living a life of agape love and 
Christ-like love, real true joy, the kind of joy that doesn't depend on circumstances, is only available to Christians. Because you need the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you for real joy to be possible in your life. I love what an old hymn that was written hundreds of years ago used to say. uh, says, It says, Jesus, you are the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment, hope for all I do. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Family, I must ask you this morning, is Jesus the center of your joy? Is Jesus, not not, not anything around you, not another person, uh, uh, not material items, is Jesus the very center of your joy? If not, I need to tell you, you are like the 10-year-old Um, Me as a 10-year-old who was opening up a box that was false advertising. Is Jesus the center of your joy? Family, it's, it's God that fills us with joy, for only God can fill us with joy. But then the question might be asked, how does, how does God fill us with this joy? Well, the answer to that question is God simply fills us with joy by the power of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. You need uh, to understand this morning, which is point number two, that, that this joy that God gives can't be something that is forced For joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Is love. It all starts with love. And then he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such things there is no law. You cannot go up to a tree and staple fruit to the tree. How well would that work? How, How successful would that be? No matter how hard you may try to staple fruit to the tree, how hard you may try to force fruit to grow onto a tree branch, it won't happen. You can purchase the very best nail gun, and you can go to the farmer's market and purchase the ripest banana, and you can go up to the tree branch and staple it uh, to the tree, but it will not last very long, for there has to be some type of power, some type of power rooted deep in the ground that provides the nourishment for the fruit to grow. There has got to be nourishment nourishment through water, sunlight, and other positive growing conditions for a tree to grow fruit. And for Christians, the positive growing conditions we need in order to grow fruit all comes first from being saved from our sins by Jesus Christ. And then the key as we live our Christian life is very simple. The key to growing fruit in your life, the fruit of joy and all the other ones, is to simply abide. Abide, abide, stay close to Jesus. Jesus says it in John chapter 15. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. He says, already some of you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. And then he says this, he says, abide. He says, abide in me and I in you. And as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And then he says this, this is a promise. He says, whoever, whoever abides in me and I in him, he, it is thee that bears much fruit. He says, for apart from me, Apart from me, apart from me, you can do nothing. For God's children, the positive growing conditions we need in order to bear fruit in our lives first comes from being saved, being declared clean by Jesus. But then the key is to abide, to abide, to remain close to the very Jesus that saved you. Why is it that sometimes we get saved and then forget all about Jesus? Why is it that some people uh, uh, think they're good because they, they, they believe they have what we call fire insurance? Uh, fire insurance. Well, I gave my life to Christ once, and, and that's all I need to do. And, and they think they have fire insurance, and they're on their, their way to heaven, and there's no abiding at all. And that person usually doesn't bear fruit. You see, if you want to have joy in your life, Jesus said you don't have to force it. 
You have to remain. You have to stay close to me. For that word abide means to stay close to or to dwell near a person. Family, if you want joy in your life, you have to stay close to Jesus. For when you stay close to Jesus, the power of his Holy Spirit will have its way in your heart. And before Noah, you know it, you become transformed from the inside out and joy will be the result. Every time I say this, I, I feel this tug and pull on, on me internally because I don't like to be elementary and I don't like to have uh, five steps to joy and three steps to love and two steps to have. I don't like doing that. But, but it, it is, it is, in the end, it's very simple. In the end, there are spiritual disciplines. There are steps in the way to abide in Jesus. And, and I know I say this said this before, but if you want to abide and and receive that joy from Jesus, you must this morning analyze your prayer life. If you're lacking in joy in this season of life, it could be that you have not been spending time and remaining close to Jesus in prayer. For instance, we know that Even Jesus, our preeminent example, made it a habit to wake up early and go by himself into a desolate place. We know that Jesus told the disciples to watch and pray that they may not fall into temptation. We know that 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us to rejoice and pray without ceasing, giving thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. The the will of God is that we pray continuously, not with a a period, but with a comma, continuing to pray. And we know that James tells us that the prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective. We know all this as Bible-believing Christians, yet when we are lacking joy in our life, when life is tossing us around like a tiny ship in the ocean, often what we do is we turn inwards when we should be abiding in Jesus in constant and, and, and concentrated, uh, intimate prayer. When life is rough and when the trials and tribulations come our way, when uh, 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 many people make the decision to run from Jesus and run from the church and run from the fellowship of brothers and sisters, and, and eventually uh, uh, the Lord, because he loves us, he allows us to fall sometimes, and he, he, he does discipline us. When all this time we have forfeited our joy that we could have had if we just would have abided in in Christ, if we just would have stayed close, if we just would have remained, if we just would have maintained relationship through prayer, ah, we fall and we end up limping when we should be running. Family, would you check your prayer life this morning? If you're lacking joy, would you please analyze the quantity and the quality of your prayer life? And then secondly, if you are lacking joy, I need you to analyze the quantity and the quality of your time being spent in the Word of God. For prayer and the Word of God go together. Romans 12, 2 says it like this. He says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of what? Your mind. That by testing you may discern what the will of God is, which is good and acceptable and perfect family. The enemy is after your mind. And sometimes we allow them. The enemy is after our mind, the, the way you think. And the only way to be transformed is by getting into the very word of God on a daily and consistent basis. Family, if you are lacking joy, if you are lacking peace, could it be that you've ignored the word of God forever, however long in your life? It doesn't take long. It doesn't take very long. Now notice, I said uh, the word of God meaning the Bible. Now, a daily devotional or listening to sermons online may help you, but often when you're lacking joy in your life, your flesh is speaking a whole lot louder than the Spirit. Isn't isn't that true? And what people tend to do when their flesh is speaking louder than the Spirit is we we start having what the Bible calls itching ears. And those with itching ears don't want to hear the truth of God's Word. And people with itching ears want to hear what makes them feel good. So the result is uh, people with itching ears start accumulating for themselves teachers 
to suit their own passions. And then they will turn away from listening to the truth and and wander off into mist. Family, don't get mad at me. That wasn't me. That was 1st, 2nd Timothy 4, 3 and 4. Oh, that's not my opinion. That's the Bible family. Oh, will we stay close to the Word of God? Sometimes we have to set aside books, even me. And you know I love my books. But sometimes we have to set aside books written by man and get into the book written by God. If you need joy in your life, I need you to check your prayer life. I need you to check the time being spent in the Word, for joy is a fruit of the Spirit given to those who abide in Christ. And then number three this morning, you need to know that, that, that no one, that nobody can take true joy away from you. John In John chapter 16, Jesus is spending his last hours with his disciples the night before he was going to be betrayed and sent to the cross. And Jesus had spent three years teaching them the principles of the kingdom of God. Jesus had attempted to get them to understand that he was on a rescue mission that would eventually lead to the cross. And on this particular occasion, Jesus was once again explaining to them truth that they did not want to hear. Jesus warned them that the world would hate them because the world has hated him first. And then Jesus gets to the bottom line in chapter 16, verse 16, and he pointed, point blank tells them that in a little while that they would see him no longer because he was going to die. And that after a little while, then they would see him again. The disciples were confused as usual, so they asked Jesus what he meant. And so Jesus took this opportunity to teach them that because of what was about to happen to him, they would have sorrow for a moment. But ultimately, their sorrow would turn into joy at his resurrection. Jesus said, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. The disciples of Jesus would be in great sorrow because Jesus did die. How many of you know Jesus really did die? Jesus died on a cross for our sins. He said, you will weep and you will lament, but the world is going to have a party. Isn't that interesting? He says, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into into joy. And he compared the sorrow and emotional pain that they would feel with the pain of childbirth when he said, when a woman is given birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So you also will have sorrow, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice. And here's what I'm trying to tell you. Jesus says, and no one will take your joy from you. Ah, isn't that good this morning? Jesus didn't mean that after giving birth, that ladies, that you would completely forget about the pain of childbirth. We know that's really not possible. But what he is saying is that the joy of the new baby far greatly exceeds the labor pains, for the new baby makes it all worth it. And so if we have a good understanding of the miracle of our salvation, the miracle of what Jesus did, then we too will experience the joy that has been given to us by Jesus, despite the many reasons to have sorrow as we live in this fallen world. Now, Jesus was never lacking reality. Jesus didn't say, oh, there's no reason for sorrow. No, there is reason for sorrow. Is there not? He just says that the joy that I'm giving you makes it all worth it. And so if we have a good understanding of the miracle of our salvation, we too can experience joy. If we understand that we've been delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son, then we can't help but have uh, overwhelming joy even in dark times. And if we understand all that Jesus went through to secure our salvation, we will also understand that if Jesus gave us our joy, then nobody or no thing can take it away from. If your friends gave you your joy, they might be able to take it away from you. If your job gives you your joy, then your job can fire you and take your joy away. If your success in life gave you your joy, then your potential and probably certain failures can take your joy away. But if Jesus gives you your joy, 
If Jesus gives you your joy, it cannot be taken from you. See, family, even if everything is falling apart, and, and we know for some, as we come to the last couple weeks of the year, 2022 has not been an easy year for you. And even if you're walking through what the Bible calls the valley of the shadow of death, the comforting truth is that if Jesus calls you his own, then you can have joy, unspeakable joy, unspeakable joy full full of glory because you have been saved and set free and sealed and delivered from a life of sin and you have been given abundant life now and forever. Family, I hope you see that biblical joy is so much deeper and so much stronger than the temporary boxes that we open. Because here's the thing, our joy is rooted in our eternal salvation. That's where our joy comes from. Yes, from Christ, but that Jesus saved us, that we're saved, that we have a future in heaven. Your joy is not rooted in other people, and your joy is not especially rooted in other people's opinion about you. Your joy is rooted in Jesus. Your joy is rooted in this great salvation that he's given us. For example, a pastor once told a story about the time he took his family to Niagara Falls, and and he had been preaching about salvation, and the Lord just dropped this this, uh, illustration on him because he was feeling in his heart that his church was neglecting their salvation, that, that they were excited about everything else except their great salvation. And so he just happened to take his family on this trip to see the Niagara Falls, and he was excited to take his kids to see this amazing waterfall, which is one of the natural wonders of the world, and, and they had been looking forward to it. And so when they arrived, they uh, sat in front of the falls, and they were just in complete awe at the power and brilliance of God's creation, that they literally spent all day just looking at the waterfall. They spent time looking at the waterfall from the United States side, and then they were still so overjoyed with God's creation that they went down in one of those boats at the base of the waterfall to see it from a different angle. And then the next day, even though it wasn't part of their plan, they were so much in awe that they decided to go to Canada's side so they can get another view of this waterfall. And all in all, they spent about 12 hours simply gazing into this waterfall, and they really didn't want to leave. So then they they, uh, uh, booked reservations in one of those high-rise hotels, uh, restaurant hotels, uh, so they can uh, dine and have dinner with their family looking again at this waterfall. And so as they ate dinner as a family, just looking at this amazing piece of God's creation, Uh, The pastor said that he started looking around and he started looking around and noticing that the waiters and the waitresses and the staff there and and uh, uh, weren't looking at the waterfalls at all. And then he noticed that there were other patrons inside the restaurant and they weren't looking at the waterfall at all. And and as he kept observing, he noticed that all the people that were there that were obviously used to seeing this great waterfall were suddenly or are over time not impressed with it at all. And yet his family was totally in awe. And the illustration in their family is that we have this great salvation in front of us. But sometimes we're not impressed with it. Sometimes we're not impressed with what God has done in our lives. Sometimes uh, we behave the same way as those patrons. We go about our life waiting on tables and, and we start complaining and criticizing and, and doing all that and we start focusing on, on lesser things when the amazing salvation is right in front of us, but we're not impressed with it. And then we wonder why we don't have any joy in our life. So again, I ask you, if you're lacking joy this morning, I need you to consider whether your salvation is so familiar with you that it has become something that is old news to you and that you're not impressed anymore. I need you to ask yourself if if the fact that Jesus substituted himself for you on the cross has become old and unimpressive news to you. 
I need you to ask yourself if the nails and the uh, 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 driven into the hands of Jesus have suddenly become unimpressive to you. I need to ask you that, that, that has the body of the Lord who was pierced for our transgressions and the blood that he shed now become unimpressive to you? Has the gospel of Jesus Christ been something that you're so used to and so unimpressed with that you go about your days waiting on tables when God's amazing miracle is right in front of you? If so, there's no wonder you might don't have joy in your life. For your joy is rooted in Jesus and your joy is rooted in the very fact that Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected and all for you. That he might save you from sin eternally. Would you take a hard look at your salvation this morning? Would you treat your salvation like a precious diamond as you gaze into the brilliance from all these different angles, completely in awe that a perfect God would die for a rebellious sinner like you and I. That God the Father would, I said it last week, it's amazing to me, God the Father would give up his son. I ain't giving up my son. But God did. Family, God fills us with joy. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. True joy can't be taken away from you because it's given by Jesus. And the last thing I want to tell you, point number four, is that the joy of the Lord, the joy of your salvation, the joy that you've been declared clean, the joy that you've been set free, the very joy of your salvation is your strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, not the joy of anything else. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah 8.10 says, Then he said to him, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy unto the Lord, and do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Family, if you've been without strength in your life, I need you to check the level of your joy. For in the book of Nehemiah, the nation of Israel was in a season of great distress and mourning as the wall of Jerusalem had been demolished and the book of the law was absent. When Ezra finally gathered up the nation and read the book of the law to them, which is another way saying that God, that Ezra read the word of God to them. And after Ezra read God's word to them, they responded with sorrow and repentance for the sins they had committed. Their hearts were so soft and they realized that they had rebelled against God. But Nehemiah didn't allow them to stay in a posture of mourning and sorrow. He told them, he said, don't grieve anymore for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so it is with us. No matter how hard or how far far you've fallen away from God, you can come back to him. By faith and repentance for the joy of the Lord will strengthen you. No matter how dark this season of life may have been for you, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is a place of safety and refuge in the storm of life. No matter how distracted you've been in this season of life, it's time to get your joy back. It's time to get your joy back by focusing on your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You see, you have an enemy who wants to take away your joy. Why does he want to take away your joy? He wants to take away your joy so you will be weak. He wants to take away your joy so you'll be weak because the joy of the Lord is your strength. But Jesus can restore it all. Even King David was restored to the joy of his salvation after he repented of his sinful actions. Family, it's time to get your joy back. It's time to get your joy back. It's time to get your joy back because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And if you have the joy of the Lord on the inside of you, then you can still be blessed this Christmas season no matter what has happened to you. If you have the joy of the Lord, you will be strong in your faith because you know that one day, because of what Jesus did on the cross, there will be no more pain and no more sorrow. And it's really just a matter of time. Family, we have such a great salvation, don't we? Our faith is centered in an amazing Savior. Jesus gave us our joy. God fills us with joy 
The joy of the Lord is our strength. It's time for us to live our life with joy and not with unnecessary burdens. It's time to start, stop limping and, and start running the race. It's time to overflow flow with joy because Jesus Christ was born. It's time to be so full of joy that we can't help but then tell the world of what Jesus Christ has done. The time is now. Uh, while there's still time to do what the Christmas hymn says, go tell it on the mountain. If the Lord has given you joy, why not go tell it on the mountain? If the Lord has rescued you from a life of sin, it's time to share the good news of your salvation. For the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If the Lord has been good to you, family, it's time to start saying so. If the Lord has delivered you from addiction and, and dead and trauma and dysfunction, it's time to start saying so. If you are far from where you used to be, maybe you're not perfect yet, but if you're far from where you used to be, it's time to start saying so. If you are here with breath in your lungs, you must realize that that is a very gift from God. It's time to start saying so. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It's really, it really is. It really is time to go. It's time to tell it on the mountain. It's time to tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. It's time to go. Yes, tell it on the mountain. What do we say? Well, we say that Jesus Christ is born. People need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth of God's word. Family, it's time to live with joy for the shepherds didn't even really know exactly what was going on. But the Bible says they still went away praising and glorifying God. And the angels, the Bible says, long to look into this great salvation that Jesus has given us. Even the angels can't peer into it like we can. Family, the joy of the Lord is your strength. It is time to say so. This, so this morning, I, I'm not going to end with a silent uh, time of reflection. I'm not going to do that. That's good to do. Uh, you can do that on your own. But I, uh, it's time to go. It's time to say so. If you have been redeemed, it's time to tell somebody. It's time to live with joy, unspeakable joy. It is time to not let the world get on our nerves anymore. It's time to stop opening boxes that, that, that promise you everything and give you nothing. It is time to say so. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for you are a wonderful God. We thank you for our great salvation. Forgive us for getting used to it. Forgive us for being unimpressed with what you did on the cross. Forgive us for going around, open up boxes that will not satisfy. Father, we ask that you'd restore us uh, to the joy of our salvation, that we would have strength. Father, give us the courage to go and say so. Give us the courage to go tell it on the mountain. Let it be an overflowing joy that we can't help to tell somebody, that we can't help to uh, uh, share our joy with someone who is discouraged that we would invite them into our joyous relationship, our joyous fellowship with you. Father, help us to go and say so. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for who you are. In Christ's name, amen.